Okay, I think we're, we're ready to get started. Welcome to our webinar this morning, this afternoon. A couple housekeeping items before we move along. Everyone's gonna be muted upon entry. We will be taking questions. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box. Um, if there's any, any housekeeping questions, we'll answer them right away. All other questions will be held till the end and the panelists will stay on to answer your questions. This meeting is being recorded and you'll be able to find, uh, we'll post a link to it on the CMQCC website as well as the California Department of Public Health website and within the next couple days. Okay, good morning uh, or afternoon everybody. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Karen Ramstrom and I'm with the Center for Family Health at the California Department of Public Health. Our department is happy to be co-hosting this webinar today with the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. At the conclusion of our speakers' presentations, we'll have a time for questions and answer, and so we look forward to um, uh, hearing from you about the questions that you have. Our first speaker is Dr. Neil Silverman. Dr. Silverman currently practices at the Center for Fetal Medicine and Women's Ultrasound in Los Angeles, where he provides consultative care for high-risk obstetric patients on a daily basis. Dr. Silverman is a clinical professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He is widely published and has a particular interest in obstetric infectious diseases, recurrent pregnancy loss and thrombophilias, and prenatal diagnosis. Nationally, Dr. Silverman currently serves on the Executive Council of the Infectious Diseases Society for Obstetrics and Gynecology. He's also serving as an invited, invited perinatal consultant to the California Department of Public Health for the current Zika outbreak. Our second speaker is Dr. Desiree LeBeau. Dr. LeBeau is a physician scientist, epidemiologist, and associate professor for the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Stanford University School of Medicine. She studies the epidemiology and ecology of domestic and international arboviruses and emerging infections with an interest in the vector, host, and environmental factors that affect the dynamics and spectrum of disease. Dr. LeBeau leads a clinical research lab focused on better understanding the risk factors and long-term health consequences of arboviral infections such as chikungunya, dengue fever, and Zika disease. Her lab also investigates the genetic and immunologic differences and host responses to arboviral infections and develops diagnostic tests that can be administered in the field. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Silverman. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us. I'd like to give special thanks to Dr. Ramstrom for helping us get our slides and coordinating this conference together at the last minute, updating our slides. And I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Um, Kathy Spong at NICHD for letting me use some of her update slides. So I'm going to start with a very brief background on, on Zika virus in general uh, because things are changing fairly rapidly even over the past few days. But just as basic background, Zika virus we know is primarily transmitted to humans through the bite of an infected Aedes mosquito and all, practically all of the Zika outbreaks that are currently being uh, explored and, and tracked are due to two species of Aedes the Aegypti and Albopictus mosquitoes, and these are the same mosquitoes that transmit dengue and chikungunya. These mosquito vectors typically breed in domestic water holding containers, and they don't require a whole lot of space to do it. In um, areas in Brazil, in the favelas, for example, these mosquitoes can breed in the amount of water that's held by a bottle cap. The difference uh, between Aegypti and some of the others, other mosquitoes that we deal with on a uh, not uncommon basis is that um, aside from feeding primarily on humans, these mosquitoes will feed on numerous humans in a single meal rather than one. They tend to live close to humans and in dwellings, not just outside. And in particular, these are daytime and nighttime feeders, not just the dusk and nighttime feeders that many of us are uh, accustomed to. This pictorial is really just here to address some of the questions I still get um, from providers that focus on how the virus is transmitted. So that especially in this recent outbreak in Florida where people have said that the mosquito 
can't fly far enough to cause a problem. This is really just to emphasize that the mosquito will bite a person who is infected with the virus, and then that person goes on to another area where the mosquitoes live, and that person can then get bitten and perpetuate an epidemic. The important thing here in this pictorial is that these mosquitoes can live indoors so that shuttering ourselves entirely indoors in endemic areas may not be as protective as we think it can be. The other less common ways are to transmit Zika are perinatally from an infected mother to the fetus, through sex, and we're seeing more of those cases be confirmed, and as well as through blood transfusion. This is a composite of where these mosquitoes live in the United States. It was initially thought that the mosquitoes primarily lived only around the Gulf Coast and in the southern part, but the CDC has revised those uh, patterns, and this is a combined map showing identified location of both species of Aedes mosquitoes, and you can see that it goes halfway up the state of California, up into New England, and well into the Midwest. So what is it about Zika that appears to be distinctive in terms of diseases and risk? We know that only about a fifth of people who are infected with the virus will actually be symptomatic, although those percentages are really based on earlier outbreaks from Polynesia and haven't absolutely been confirmed in the current Latin American outbreaks. And among those with clinical illness, the symptoms tend to be mild, typically will develop within a week from exposure and only last a short period of time with characteristic clinical findings being fever, a, an exanthem-like maculopapular rash, arthralgia, and conjunctivitis. Severe disease requiring hospitalization is uncommon, and fatalities appear to be rare. There's also been an increase in Guillain-Barre syndrome um, following Zika infection. Since October of last year, there's been a 50% increase in cases reported in Colombia. And this actually shouldn't be entirely surprising because Zika, like West Nile virus, transmitted by the same mosquitoes, or uh, transmitted, um, is also a flavovirus, not by the same mosquitoes, sorry. Um, and there appears to be an immune response that causes the neurologic symptoms that's seen with um, Guillain-Barre. This is a pictorial showing the clinical findings that were identified in a cohort of uh, pregnant women reported in uh, early spring in the New England Journal out of Brazil. And you can see here this sort of characteristic rash on the face. This, I think, is a particularly helpful slide because you can see how the rash blanches um, on touching. This is conjunctivitis. There are postauricular nodes that have also been described. But Zika obviously has come to uh, such a degree of attention because of its association with microcephaly. This is a slide from the CDC showing the difference between a baby with typical head size and a baby with microcephaly. Since the outbreak has been identified by um, uh, these newborns with microcephaly being born in Brazil, there have been a little over 1,500 confirmed cases of microcephaly attributed to Zika in, the, in Brazil and another 3,000 that are still suspected and being investigated. And as you see, this doesn't include an additional 3,200 cases of microcephaly that were initially thought to be Zika-related but have been investigated and discarded. So there may be as many as 4,500 cases of Zika-attributable microcephaly in Brazil at the present time. So microcephaly was the marker that first came to attention because a newborn with microcephaly is, not, is easy to identify. Um, this is a very specific diagnosis. It was seen in newborns in northeastern Brazil, and only when these newborns were brought, brought to pediatric specialties in larger cities did they realize that there may be a trend that was emerging in this region. It is, uh, on ultrasound, microcephaly is typically defined as a head circumference at less than the third percentile for gestational age uh, when we do ultrasounds prenatally. And microcephaly then became an early trigger to search for whether there might be an association with earlier brain abnormality evolving um, prior to the evolution of true microcephaly. And this spectrum of disease eventually did become apparent 
microcephaly is now actually thought to be a result of a brain, a fetal brain disruption sequence that appears to be um, the true pathology of fetal Zika infection. In fact, um, in the earlier outbreak, smaller and earlier outbreak in Polynesia in 2014, uh, researchers went back to some of those cases and identified higher rates of fetal central nervous system abnormalities in some women who subsequently tested positive for Zika, even though none of those women's actual, women actually had symptoms. So the brain abnormalities that have been associated short of microcephaly with Zika infection are things like microcephaly, but also hydrocephalus and hydranencephaly, absence of critical intracranial structures, neuronal migration disorders such as lysencephaly, intracerebral calcifications, and brain asymmetry. It's also been associated, as you can see in these uh, images down here, with uh, very severe chorioretinitis in a series out of Brazil that was published in JAMA Ophthalmology in March. Um, there, and we also are realizing that there may be long-term neurologic abnormalities like hypertonia and arthrogryposis and seizures seen in newborns with and without microcephaly who are Zika infected. And um, Dr. LeBeau is going to talk uh, a good bit more about those issues. These are just some slides showing some of the images in the earlier series. This is a series out of Brazil that was published in um, an ultrasound journal earlier this year in January. And you can see here, this is a coronal view of the head on ultrasound, markedly dilated ventricles. This is a, a sagittal view of the head where you can see these enormous um, intracranial ventricles. And here, these arrows are actually pointing to um, congenital cataracts with uh, opacification of the lens. These are some newborn MRIs that were, uh, or that were um, seen, published in a series published in the British Medical Journal uh, about a month and a half ago. And you can see that this brain is incredibly smooth, uh, representing lysencephaly. And the next slide from the same series actually shows a newborn with um, classic but incredibly severe microcephaly. So um, I think some of the most important data we have in terms of predicting risk for women who are infected with Zika came from a series published in March in the New England Journal uh, out of Brazil. And the first author on the paper is also named Brazil, which makes it a little confusing. But it is the Brazil series. And um, this group had actually been conducting surveillance for dengue in Brazil for a number of years. And they noticed in late 2015 that there was an increase in dengue-like illness with a rash that coincided with a similar a surge of similar cases in the northeastern part of Brazil, which was ultimately identified as Zika. And they, uh, that they identified a study cohort of 88 symptomatic pregnant women. Uh, and that picture of the symptoms comes from these women. 82% of these women who were symptomatic tested positive for Zika in either blood, urine, or both. And what these investigators were able to do, which is so unique and so important, is they were able to prospectively follow a cohort of confirmed cases of Zika in pregnant women anywhere from the first trimester through um, to, to the end. Interestingly, of the 72 women who had PCR positive test results, over half of them reported an ill family member and 20% had an ill partner. Uh, two of the women miscarried in the first trimester. Of the remainder, 60% of the others had ultrasounds performed. And uh, 28 women actually declined ultrasound because they either lived too far away to participate or they were uh, frightened of actually finding anomalies. And of the women who had serial ultrasounds, almost a third of them had some type of abnor abnormal ultrasound results seen uh, with no abnormalities seen in any of the women who were Zika negative. There was intrauterine growth restriction seen in 42% of the women with or without microcephaly. Cerebral calcifications were seen in a third, and other central nervous system abnormalities were seen in two of the fetuses. In two of the women who were actually infected later um, in the pregnancy than the first or second trimester, they uh, ultimately had intrauterine fetal death at 30 and 38 weeks. 
and it's thought that there may actually be an impact on placenta from a late overwhelming infection rather than an overwhelming infection of the fetus itself. Um, subsequent to that, there was a case reported in Washington, D.C. by Rita Driggers and her group, and uh, this was a woman who uh, had traveled to Latin America, to Brazil, and then came back to the Washington area and subsequently uh, did not continue the pregnancy, but they were able on uh, pathology to document that Zika was found, Zika RNA was found in high levels in fetal brain, placenta, membranes, and cord. The thing that's particularly interesting about this case is that the maternal viremia in this case lasted almost five weeks in, in the face of an infected fetus. And researchers have looked at that fact in some detail, and they actually believe that women, pregnant one, that pregnant women seem to have viremia for longer periods of time than non-pregnant adults do. And if a pregnant woman has prolonged viremia, it may actually be a marker for fetal infection because this virus is in the maternal plasma, not in the maternal urine. And assuming the maternal immune system is relatively intact, uh, researchers are now beginning to believe that the fetal RNA is being transmitted back through the placenta into the maternal circulation so that this maternal viremia in a prolonged way is actually fetal virus rather than maternal virus. Dr. David O'Connor at the University of Wisconsin is doing research in this area on primates, on macaques, and um, he is actually demonstrating that that may actually be the case. So in addition to some of these prenatal complications and newborn, immediate newborn complications, there are unfortunately emerging reports and series of long-term functional motor and sensory abnormalities seen in Zika-infected newborns. There are two reports that have just been uh, published over the past couple weeks. One was in the BMJ just a week and a half ago, reporting on seven infants with microcephaly and abnormal MRIs who also had arthrogryposis, which was thought to be on a neurologic, not on a muscular basis. And Pistorius et al. Uh, from the CDC have identified a series of late onset microcephaly from Brazil who had normal head size at birth, but then developed an abnormal head size by six months of age. So the question, unfortunately, is are we going to have to anticipate a spectrum of outcomes that includes things like developmental delay, intellectual impairments, other uh, mental disorders such as autism and, and motor uh, abnormalities? And I'm not going to say much more about that because do, um, Dr. LeBeau is going to address that in terms of surveillance. But these are some of the um, images from the Vander Linden series just published in the BMJ showing these newborns with severe uh, arthrogryposis. So knowing what Zika can do, the questions we as clinicians get on an almost daily basis is where people can go and where is Zika and where is it not. This is um, the current, actually, as of a couple days ago, the Bahamas was just added to this CDC map for the Caribbean. But this is the map that we see on the CDC website telling us where um, Zika is currently being transmitted locally. You can see it's mostly in Latin America, one little spot off the coast of Africa in Cape Verde, and a few islands in the Pacific. In the United States, as of um, a little over a week ago, Travel-associated Zika virus cases um, have been about 1,955 in the U.S. and D.C., with 22 of those being confirmed as sexually transmitted, and six cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, as we all know, there are now locally acquired vector-borne cases being reported in Florida, and as of this morning, that number has gone up to 36 rather than 33. Um, and there's been one recent Zika attributable death in an elderly traveler in Utah. In the U.S. territories, travel-associated cases are outnumbered by locally acquired cases, and those uh, locally acquired cases as of yesterday are increased to about 8,500 cases, mostly in Puerto Rico. In terms of what we're seeing in 
pregnant women, as of uh, the most recent statistics, there are 529 pregnant travelers with laboratory evidence of um, imported Zika infection. Uh, to date, we know of no pregnant women who have had local transmission within the United States. 16 reported live-born infants and uh, five fetal losses with Zika-related birth defects. And those losses include spontaneous and terminations. In the territories, there's almost 700 pregnant cases. And in California, um, we now have 24 as of, um, as of this morning, 24 cases in pregnant women and a report of two live-born infant uh, with uh, Zika-associated Zika uh, birth defects and no fetal losses. This shows you where Zika is in the United States. And you can see that the dark blue is where they have the most number of cases. Our numbers in California actually just increased <clears throat> this morning to 170. Um, but the largest number of cases you can see are in New York and in Florida. When we look at imported Zika cases here in California, they are clustered mostly in Southern California in LA and San Diego counties. But we actually see clustering in the middle part of the state, the Bay Area and North. This tabularly tells us where Zika cases are, 24 pregnant women, none so far locally acquired. So the calls we get from our patients who are afraid to go in their backyard in the San, San Fernando Valley are unfounded. But you can see that the majority of cases here are in LA and San Diego counties that have been um, identified. And in terms of where these cases are from, where people have traveled, the majority of travel has been in Mexico and then areas in Central America uh, following and then some to the Caribbean. Locally, we know that the, the mosquitoes live here. These are some maps that um, unfortunately are overlapping a bit, but this shows us LA County and San Diego County. The red dot shows, show us where Aedes aegypti has been identified in vector surveillance um, surveys. And the blue are where albopictus have been identified. And these black triangles show us where the, Zika, the imported Zika cases in San Diego County and then um, in LA County have been identified. We, the mosquitoes do live here, but we have no locally transmitted cases. I just want to address briefly, there was a little bit of a flurry of interest in Culex mosquitoes, which are the West Nile virus uh, mosquitoes, which do live here in Southern California. There were some reports from Brazil that suggested that Culex mosquitoes might actually be able to transmit Zika as well. However, some researchers from UT, UT Galveston earlier this month actually captured these species and fed them infected blood and were unable to document Culex in uh, the uh, Zika in the Culex mosquitoes, where they were able to identify uh, Zika in the uh, 80s mosquitoes. So I think this may be not as much of a concern uh, as the 80s mosquitoes at all. One of the primary areas uh, that we see cases uh, transmitted from is in Mexico. This is a, a, the most recent map that we have from the Mexican Ministry of Health showing us really where the cases are in Mexico in terms of where people travel to and travel from. And not surprisingly, the majority of these cases with these darker areas are closer to Guatemala and the rest of Central America. There have been no reported cases anywhere here in Baja or in the border states of Chihuahua or Sonora. So I think this is important information for us to uh, use clinically and to counsel our patients about. And when we zoom up this area, we can see that some of the resort areas uh, outside of Baja have actually had uh, mild to moderate numbers of cases of locally transmitted Zika, primarily the area around Puerto Vallarta and the area in Guerrero State around Acapulco. This um, is a CDC map just to emphasize that the CDC has actually gone away from its uh, travel restriction advisory for the middle spine of Mexico because of altitude. So that these mosquitoes do not live above 2,000 meters or 6,500 feet. So if we have someone flying directly from Los Angeles to Mexico City, for example, for business, 
then those folks are not under the same advisory as other lower altitude areas of Mexico. So really this, this higher altitude spine of Mexico is an important exception to uh, concerns. And then of course, uh, over the past couple of weeks, we have been hearing uh, more and more news about the fact that this uh, issue has hit the United States. I think most of us realize that it ultimately would. And uh, it has emerged with local transmission in Florida, which initially was identified in this very small one mile area in the northern part of um, Miami proper. And the advisory was initially for the one mile radius uh, of the Wynwood area of Miami. I think many of us who deal with this on a clinical basis um, realize that, as I said earlier, while the mosquitoes may not travel that far, people who get bitten by the mosquitoes in that area can travel elsewhere in the state of Florida where the mosquitoes also live. So we have actually seen a cluster of cases in Miami Beach proper, which is, for those of you who haven't been to Florida, is really just across this blue water on this peninsula down here. So there actually has been a cluster of five cases just reported over the past day in Miami Beach, um, which shows that people travel and the mosquitoes are waiting for them to come there. Uh, so in terms of local transmission in Florida, the number of locally acquired uh, cases attributable to uh, seen with Zika is now up to 36 as of this morning. Um, the Florida D Department of Health actually has expanded the uh, area of concern outside of Wynwood to a one and a half square mile radius in um, Miami Beach. And they are doing door-to-door -door outreach and sampling and uh, obviously mosquito abatement and reduction is ongoing. We have also just recently had our first case of travel-related Zika infection within the United States. The Texas Department of Public Health just identified and confirmed a case of someone who traveled to Florida and went back to Texas, where unfortunately the mosquitoes also live. So all that said, how do we move forward in terms of educating ourselves and our patients and how should we order testing and what should we tell our pregnant patients? So one of the questions we will frequently get is how much fetal risk is associated with a confirmed maternal infection and based on current data, I counsel people that the range may be as high as 29% based on prospective data from Brazil. Despite some earlier reports, recent data suggests that a later gestational age and infection does not exclude a potential adverse out outcome. Um, pregnant women just shouldn't travel to areas with active Zika transmission. I am telling pregnant women not to travel to uh, um, Miami-Dade and Broward counties at the very least, and uh, they may wish to consider non-essential travel to Florida overall. If uh, someone is in an area with transmission, protection and prevention strategies are important. So women should, uh, pregnant women in particular, should try to wear long sleeve uh, clothing to protect against bites and to use repellent. DEET and picaridin have been shown to be the most effective repellents, DEET usually in a concentration of at least 25%. Both of these agents are absolutely fine for use during pregnancy. The other thing is that folks who are coming from in, uh, areas of local transmission, pregnant or not, should be using insect repellent for three weeks after they return to keep them from being attractive to the mosquitoes that might live in their home areas. So we want to keep them from being a food source for local mosquitoes. And we still are advocating the use of ultrasound on a serial basis. Um, this is uh, the initial um, extended protocol that was put out by the CDC earlier this year. But fetal ultrasound is still an important component of surveillance. We're not really going to see microcephaly at 20, 24, 26 weeks. But it is important to monitor these pregnancies uh, probably no more frequently than every three to four weeks uh, until laboratory testing results become available to look for some of these early subtle changes that have been identified in intracranial anatomy. 
uh, both the CDC here and um, the and ACOG and SMSM have uh, issued updated practice advisories on Zika based on the re revised recommendations for testing that were just issued at the end of July by the CDC. So um, this came out in the MMWR on the 25th of July, which essentially expanded testing for pregnant women. And that was the primary goal of this expansion. It was really attempting to increase the proportion of pregnant women with Zika infection who actually get diagnosed. We should be asking women about Zika exposure both travel and sexual uh, transmission at each prenatal visit during their pregnancy and only be testing pregnant women with a positive exposure history. We need to recognize the risks of sexual transmission regardless of whether the sexual partner who had traveled to a risk area had symptoms or not. And this is a change. Previously, we were only talking about testing pregnant women if their sexual partner returned from an area where local transmission was occurring. Uh, if they had symptoms, now it is independent of the symptomatology of the partner. And we should also be asking about partner travel history at uh, prenatal visits. Uh, the new guidelines also recognize longer time uh, for viral RNA detection in some pregnant women compared to pregnant non-pregnant adults. And we are still not testing asymptomatic partners of pregnant women in these guidelines, but we should still be emphasizing the use of condoms uh, through the entire pregnancy for male and female sexual partners. What sort of testing is available? So the testing consists of PCR and IgM antibody testing. PCR is basically looking for the virus itself, evidence of uh, viral RNA. And this is offered to all patients with symptoms within two weeks after onset of symptoms. And we're testing both blood and urine in these patients because it's been shown that the viral RNA may be detectable in urine for a longer period of time than it's detectable in blood. If the patient is asymptomatic and pregnant, then any exposure within the past two weeks warrants PCR testing. And that's a change. So that that includes sex with a male or female partner who traveled. Um, and if that PCR on the pregnant woman is negative, we should still do antibody testing two to 12 weeks after uh, her exposure. So these are really significant changes in the way the guidelines read until the end of July. All other pregnant patients with exposure, including sexual contact with a traveler, meaning after uh, two weeks, we should be testing them for Zika-specific IgM antibodies. These antibodies typically will develop toward the end of the first week of illness. And testing in asymptomatic patients should be no earlier than two weeks after exposure and no later than 12 weeks. In our county and state labs, the turnaround time shouldn't be more than two to three weeks, although we all know that in certain cases, um, the test results are taking a bit longer. And then if the antibody results are positive, and uh, the labs are doing confirmatory testing to sort out other uh, potentially cross-reacting antibodies like antibodies to dengue and chikungunya. Um, this is a graphic that I worked on a reporter from the Huffington Post with. It will be in the slide set. But this basically outlines um, a stratification of pregnant or not pregnant and takes into account the new July guidelines, and folks will be able to have that. It sort of streamlined um, the, um, the, the guideline um, algorithm for folks. So how do we do testing? Um, up until recently, uh, this testing was only available through uh, state and county public health labs. There has now been emergency approval for uh, PCR testing in commercial labs. Up until very recently, there was just one lab. I will absolutely tell you folks, I have no commercial interest in any of these commercial labs. So I will name them. LabCorp uh, is offering PCR testing on blood and urine um, for pregnant women. Uh, I will tell you that having tried to work with them, the cost is actually fairly significant. There's anywhere from a four to $800 out-of-pocket cost for patients compared to no cost if it's done through the state lab. 
The only advantage being that their turnaround time is advertised at three to five days. Um, and their collection issues, they're uh, requiring frozen samples to be sent to them on serum rather than uh, plasma, which doesn't necessarily require frozen samples. So uh, folks who wish to pay out of pocket need to go to realistically one of their local draw stations to have the uh, blood drawn and processed. I will say that uh, neural to MTD labs based out of New York is just starting to do PCR testing. I just spoke to their laboratory supervisor this morning because this is a clinical issue that we deal with. And um, they are starting to offer uh, approved um, PCR testing on blood and urine as well with the maximum out-of-pocket cost to patients at $165. And if folks are interested in that, you need to contact their lab and establish a, an account to get samples to them but those can be drawn in your office and don't need to be frozen. Um, LabCorp has recently been approved to, to perform the same IgM test uh, that the CDC is doing. Their advertised turnaround time is five to seven days, although they still have a fairly uh, rigorous collection protocol and we are sending people to their draw stations if they wish to do it through them rather than through the uh, county labs. Uh, the out-of-pocket cost for that is ranging in uh, $75 to $150. Clinicians should still be aware of current guidelines for testing. You should know where the travel uh, risk areas are. The CDC consistently updates their guides. And I just can't emphasize strongly enough that we need to be taking travel and sexual histories of patients and partners. So what do we not know? The question is um, about uh, now we're talking mostly male sexual partners, but the, um, how long the infection can uh, be present how in semen or vaginal fluids to infect a sexual partner. Uh, in the Lancet, there has been transmission through semen uh, identified up to 41 days after uh, the partner's infection. Uh, recently in the Lancet, there was uh, identification of Zika-specific RNA 90 days after and a very recent study in a journal, Eurosurveillance, showed that uh, urine in an infected man was seen to be Zika RNA positive up to 91 days after initial infection and uh, almost four months, a little over four months uh, in semen. We don't know if Zika can be transmitted through saliva or other body fluids, and we don't know the transmission risk or duration right yet after asymptomatic infection but the CDC is currently doing a project in Puerto Rico looking at both symptomatic and uh, asymptomatic men, and hopefully we will have more information from that uh, cohort. We know that sexual transmission can occur from men to women, from women to men, and from men to men. We don't have documentation of woman to, uh, female to female transmission, but we, we have no reason to think that it couldn't occur. Again, Male partners at risk for Zika should uh, consider using condoms or abstaining for the duration of a pregnancy. The duration um, right now is for a male partner. Uh, if they have, are symptomatic and these are couples looking to try to get pregnant, the woman is not yet pregnant, we're, uh, CDC is recommending eight week waiting period if the man is not symptomatic and six months if the man is symptomatic. And finally, uh, there is an additional impact of Zika on OBGYN care. It's, it's gotten over to egg and sperm donors so that ASRM has basically said donors should not, uh, egg and sperm donors are ineligible for six months if they travel to an area of transmission. And uh, we've all seen in the news reports that this has had a major impact on blood bank capabilities. And there is a rapid uh, PCR test of blood products that was just initiated was in Puerto Rico and uh, is now being initiated on donations in Miami where blood co local blood collections have been uh, stopped until that can be put into place. So with that, I'm going to turn the uh, talk over to uh, Dr. LeBeau. Hi. Thank you, Neil. That was fantastic. Um, I also want to thank the organizers for including me in this presentation, this webinar. Um, so uh, this morning, I woke to find that the CDC has actually now released new guidance for the testing and evaluation of infants. 
Um, on July 21st to 22nd, CDC met with the American Academy of Pediatrics, convened a meeting of experts to try to come up with guidance and discuss three main areas, initial evaluation and laboratory testing of infants, outpatient management and follow-up of infants with abnormal physical exams and consistent with congenital Zika syndrome, and then outpatient management and follow-up of infants with laboratory evidence of congenital Zika virus infection, but without findings consistent with congenital Zika. And so I um, made new slides this morning that actually show this, um, these new guidelines, and I'm going to take you through those right now. Hopefully everyone can see my desktop. So um, I'm going to start. Initially, um, the babies were supposed to be evaluated after um, having a mother with confirmed laboratory evidence of Zika. But now what they say is a mother with laboratory evidence of Zika, definitely the baby should be evaluated. But also if you have an infant who has findings which may be consistent with congenital Zika, but the mother does not have laboratory confirmed Zika, then you should continue to follow these guidelines still. So the first thing to do with these babies is to perform a comprehensive physical exam to get a head ultrasound, a hearing test, and specific Zika virus testing. So what does that mean? So at delivery, the most important specimen that anyone can collect who's worried about possible congenital Zika virus infection is the infant serum. And you want to get that serum test within the first two days of birth, if possible, because that really nails down the congenital Zika virus infection and makes it less confusing about whether or not the baby might have been exposed postnatally or so forth. So you need it within that first two days of birth. And the testing that should be done on that infant is, as, as Dr. Silverman sort of pointed out, you want to do PCR testing to look for that viral RNA, and then you also want to do antibody testing, specifically IgM antibodies for Zika and also for dengue, which is probably the, the virus that is most closely related to Zika and will cross-react. If the baby happens to be evaluated um, for other reasons and you happen to be doing um, an LP and CSF is available, then you can also send that CSF for virus testing and for IgM testing. If available, you can send the placenta for histopathological evaluation to look for Zika by PCR on fixed and frozen tissue. And, of course, by this time you should probably have the maternal serum tested, but if not, you can go ahead and send mother's blood also um, at delivery for Zika virus antibody testing. And there's a table that I show next that just shows the type of containers that you need to use to collect these specimens and then when to collect. And again, I just want to point out for the baby, it's serum that should be collected and it should be in that first two days of life. Um, on this slide, on this table, you'll see second to the bottom, they also mention cord blood. These are slightly old guidelines, but the guidelines that were issued this morning, they no longer recommend cord blood testing because they say um, you can sometimes have false positives through contamination with maternal blood, and you might also have false negative results with cord blood. So they want to shy away from cord blood testing and instead really test the infant itself, get infant serum, and send off your PCR and your antibody test. Now, what is the evaluation for these infants that have possible congenital Zika virus infection? Well, of course, initially and foremost, import, uh, foremost, foremost importance is the physical examination. So you want to do a comprehensive physical examination, including careful measurement of the head circumference, the length, the weight, and then assessment of gestational age. And then you want to evaluate for the specific abnormalities that Dr. Silverman sort of brought up. We don't yet know the entire spectrum of Zika virus infection in these congenitally infected babies, but we're starting to get more and more information and the spectrum of disease is getting wider and wider. So when you do your physical exam, you want it to be very thorough. You want to concentrate on neurologic abnormalities, looking for any dysmorphic features, looking for hepatosplenomegaly, rash, other skin lesions, and so forth. And then all babies should also have a cranial ultrasound. They should have a hearing test by evoked autoacoustic emissions or auditory brainstem response testing, either before discharge from the hospital, but for sure within a month after birth. They should also have a formal ophthalmologic ex examination that includes retinal exam, again, before discharge from the hospital or within a month after birth, and then anything else that you might have identified on physical examination that you, need, that you think needs further follow-up, you will go ahead and, and do those things. 
So back to our, our um, flow chart here. So once you've performed that comprehensive physical exam and the testing, and you find an infant who actually has findings consistent with congenital Zika syndrome, then you go on to a separate, more, um, more detailed examination. And this is those tests. So first and foremost, you're going to start consulting a lot of specialists. So you're going to consult your pediatric neurologist to determine appropriate brain imaging of this infant, especially if there were either prenatal or postnatal calcifications or abnormalities on that ultrasound. You're going to talk to your friendly local pediatric infectious disease specialist to get their input and to make sure that you're testing for other congenital infections and so forth. You're going to get a formal consultation with an ophthalmologist for that comprehensive eye exam. And, um, plan to, again, get that either before discharge or within the one month of birth. Um, and then new to these guidelines, the ones released this morning, you're going to consult your pediatric endocrinologist for evaluation for hypothalamic or pituitary dysfunction. You're going to speak with a clin clinical geneticist or dysmorphologist if there are those concerns. And then, depending on what you find in the physical examination, you may consider consulting an orthopedist, PT, a pulmonologist if you're worried about aspiration, GI if you're worried about feeding, lactation, nutrition, speech and occupational therapy, and ENT. The testing for the baby that needs to be done has to include a complete blood count with a platelet count and liver function and enzyme test, and then again, that auditory brainstem response to assess their hearing. So once you, you do that, initial evaluation, and you actually have laboratory-confirmed or probable Zika virus infection, then you're going to need to manage this baby outpatient. You're going to do the outpatient management of this congenital Zika virus patient. And so what does that look like? Well, first and foremost, you need to establish a medical home and have the patient coming back for primary care visits monthly, at least for the first six months of life. It's imperative that you follow growth and monitor development very closely over this time. You want to provide routine immunizations, anticipatory guidance, psychosocial support, and really ensure that the infants receive the necessary testing and the consultations that I mentioned in the previous slide. Neurologic examination by the primary care provider also needs to happen at one and two months of age, and you can refer to neurology for any abnormalities or concerns seen. You also need to refer to developmental specialists and early intervention services as needed. You want to repeat comprehensive refer to OPSO for any abnormal findings. And you want to repeat the hearing testing at age four to six months and refer to audiology for any abnormal findings or concerns. Finally, you want to repeat testing for hypothyroidism at age two weeks and three months, even if the initial testing results were normal, and then refer to endocrinology if you find anything abnormal. And important, very important, is you want to continue to provide family and supportive services, because um, a baby with congenital Zika virus infection may have long-standing health complications that are going to need a lot of extra support for that family. Now, if you go ahead and you do that initial evaluation, and you, and you find that the infant actually doesn't have many of the findings for congenital Zika, then you just evaluate for other infections with your infectious disease specialist, and you, and you treat other causes as applicable. If once you perform the physical examination, the hearing ultrasound, and Zika testing on the baby, and you don't find any physical findings that are all associated with congenital Zika, but the laboratory testing on the infant, that serum that you duly collected in the first two days of life, turns up positive by IgM or by PCR for the baby, then you want to go ahead and do routine care of the infant and follow up on any clinical findings. You do hearing and ophthalmologic exam within a month, and then you follow up those babies. And those babies, um, this is a specific follow-up for those babies who look on laboratory studies like they have Zika, but you can't find anything on physical exam. Pretty much these mirror what you see with the babies that have abnormalities on physical exam, but they're slightly different. So you establish the medical home. Again, first and foremost, growth parameters, developmental screening at each well child visit. You want to emphasize anticipatory guidance again, 
specifically regarding developmental milestones, feeding and growth, sleep and irritability, and abnormal movements. Because what you're trying to find here are, you know, you want the parents to be part of your team who can identify anything that may be going on in the baby that is not normal and bring it to your attention quickly. You definitely want to screen development. You want to use a standardized validated developmental screening tool at nine months or earlier for any concerns. And then you're going to refer to ophthalmology for the eye exam and perform the hearing testing. You want to repeat the auditory brainstem response at four to six months or perform behavioral diagnostic testing at nine months of age and refer to audi audiology for any abnormal findings. And then, of course, you want to continue to provide support to the family. And then to finish up here, so if you initially evaluate the baby, you don't find any findings on physical exam that are consistent, and the lab testing is negative, then you would just perform routine care of your baby. Um, in the new guidelines that were released today in the MMWR, there is this nice um, chart there, which I'm not going to go to, but for those of you who like the timeline type chart, um, they have broken it down both by um, the mother with laboratory evidence of Zika and um, infants that have abnormalities on exam and then those without any evidence of abnormalities and then take you through the testing that needs to be done, the follow-up, and the management. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. These are the resources that both Dr. Silverman and I and our sponsors have used. They're up here for your resource. Um, we will be posting these updated slides but you can also have access to them with the new guidelines. And now I think we'll send it back to the um, sponsor so that they can start to the Q&A session. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Desiree. We also have Sharon Messinger from the state who is joining us for the Q&A panel. You can go ahead and put your questions in at the Q&A box in the bottom. Looks like we have one. Is there any evidence or is Zika too new related to risk to future pregnancies after mom is cured of the virus? So I can, I can address that. Um, and once someone's infected, they appear to be immune. It's the whole, you know, the whole issue of trying to develop a, a vaccine because these appear to be neutralizing antibodies so that if someone is infected, they should not really be at risk for any future pregnancies. Thank you. Is there any other where we're asked when the recording will be available? We will have this probably on Monday. There will be a link to the recording and the slides will also be available at the same time. So I see a question there about number of ultrasound to perform. I think if someone is not tested, I would, I, I don't think I would stop at 28 weeks because if we don't have the ability to test them, I would watch them every four to five weeks, even through the third trimester, because we know that some of these can be late onset findings, and if we can't confirm negative test results, I would feel strongly about watching them through the first trimester and not just empirically stop at 28 weeks. I have another question. What is the current data on infants, young children, and Zika infection? Assuming that their brains are still rapidly developing, should surveillance or testing be performed if infection is suspected? I can take that one. So again, we're unsure at this time um, what the full spectrum of Zika virus is um, for babies that are exposed in utero. And so, um, as Dr. Silverman sort of showed us, and as we've, we've alluded to, there is this wide spectrum of disease, and it's getting wider every day. Um, there aren't any studies right now released on older children who get Zika virus, let's say within the first um, year of life, let's say they travel or if they're in an endemic country and um, they um, acquire Zika through the bite of an infected mosquito. Um, we don't know yet if that's going to have any impact on that child. Um, many mosquito-borne viral infections do have long-standing um, health complications and can lead to, you know, neurologic disease, encephalitis, meningitis, and so forth. And so we're unsure at this point um, what what um, the full spectrum is. But if, if the provider was concerned that Zika was causing some significant disease in the child, then I would think at that point you could go ahead and test the child for Zika. 
I don't think there's been any guidelines released at all about, about this issue, but I'm sure they'll be forthcoming um, as we get more and more information. Okay, we have a question. Does documented Zika infection guarantee immunity from future Zika exposure? As far as we know, yes. Actually, there are some uh, animal studies looking at infecting primates and then reintroducing the infection to them, and none of the uh, previously infected primates developed infection. So we do have a, an experimental primate model to confirm what we believe to be true clinically. Okay, there is a question I'd like to address just to clarify about whether pregnant patients who are infected should be counseled that the risk of microcephaly is up to 29%. I, I, I want to emphasize that it's not just microcephaly, that at least in that prospective series, the risk of any fetal abnormality is, was 29%. So not all those abnormalities were microcephaly, but in the setting of confirmed maternal infection, the risk of some type of adverse fetal outcome may be as high as 29%. So that is true. Next question, can you speak a little more about the vaccine? Do you anticipate one to be available? I will tell you that the CDC, that um, NIH and other agencies have three vaccines that are being explored using different platforms. Uh, there were some preliminary data that, were pu that was published in, um, I want to say in Science, the journal Science, in early August. Um, one of these is being funded by the NIH, other two are um, um, commercially based ventures. And the question is whether it's best to use killed vaccine particles or whether it's best to link to a, a, an adenovirus. So all three of these platforms, at least in experimental animals, and these are primate models, um, showed some degree of high levels of neutralizing antibodies, and they are currently starting uh, clinical trials in healthy adults to uh, look at immune responses of some of these vaccines. So we may actually have some human results in the next year. Next question, is there anything that can be done prenatally for the fetus to mitigate negative outcomes? Short answer is no. I mean, in the face, in the face of a confirmed maternal infection, unfortunately not. Um, I have a question. Uh, it is then suggested for women not yet wanting to get pregnant to get exposed to Zika. So down the road when they are trying to get pregnant, are they safe? Um, so this question, should someone who wants to get pregnant try to get infected? Sort of like throwing a kid into a room full of kids with chicken pox. Yeah, like a chicken pox party. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know how you can guarantee that you're going to get infected, but ideally you would get infected before you got pregnant, especially if you live in a, an area where local transmission is ongoing. I see a question there on lactation referral. What's the current recommendation for breastfeeding mothers with positive PCR testing? So although Zika virus has been detected in breast milk, no cases of Zika virus infection associated with breastfeeding have been reported. And current evidence suggests that the benefits of breastfeeding probably outweigh the theoretical risk of transmission by breast milk. And so all women with Zika virus infection during pregnancy should be encouraged and supported to breastfeed their infants regardless of the, the infant's Zika virus testing results. I have another question. Are there recommendations for preconception testing of women or partners who have traveled to endemic areas and who would like to become pregnant? No. Those, those, are, those tests are not being recommended unless one of them was symptomatic. Those are, that's what the guidelines say. So regardless of travel to an area, um, it's not being recommended that global screening of asymptomatic people who have traveled to an area be, be performed. You'd be doing IgM testing, and if you start screening a huge population of low-risk people, you're going to increase your risk of false positives. I have a question directed to Dr. Silverman. 
Given third trimester cases of intrauterine fetal demise, do you also recommend NSP surveillance weekly starting at 32 weeks, 34 weeks? I think that if you have a case of confirmed maternal infection um, and the fetus has not been tested, then um, I would say no. Um, these are just two cases there, and it depends on when. So I'm sorry. If the fetus has not been tested, so we don't know whether the fetus is infected and it's a confirmed maternal infection, I would actually consider doing fetal testing, but only in the setting of a confirmed maternal infection, not someone who has traveled but been outside the guidelines for testing. But I would encourage, and there's one other question there, that testing of the fetus is available. PCR can be done on amniotic fluid through the CDC. And um, we've actually seen one case here with a confirmed maternal infection in our practice and luckily a negative amnio result. Still have a lot of questions about the slides. The slides and the recording is going to be available on both the California Department of Public Health website and the CMQCC website. Not seeing any other new questions. I see one. Are there future concerns to the mother's health if there's a confirmed Zika infection? Um, I'm not sure we have long-term data on this, but this appears to be an acute infection so that uh, if the woman does not have significant sequelae and she doesn't develop Guillain-Barre syndrome as an unusual complication, we don't really anticipate any long-term health issues for an adult, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. And I'm sorry, I didn't clarify. Um, it will be available by, by Monday, the, the webinar link will be. Um, we have a question, what is the reference for 29% risk? Um, it is, it's on one of the slides, it's Brazil et al. from the New England Journal of Medicine in March. E-R-A-S-I-L is the last name. Do you foresee an increase in worldwide cases following the Olympics? You know, there was a study that was published in the New England Journal tracking sort of the net travel to and from Brazil from the Olympics, um, you know, to the U.S. and other countries. And realistically, I don't think that there's going to be, what the model showed is that the net influx of travel to the United States resulting from the Olympics is not expected to be larger than the usual amount of travel between Brazil and the U.S. over a comparable period of time. I think that what we're seeing, as we're seeing, the greater risk is local transmission spreading within the United States. We have a question um, from someone who cares for farm workers in Mexico. Will all travel to Mexico last 12 weeks need test in the last 12 weeks need testing? Farm workers. I'm not sure I understand. Um, I, th I think it's if if uh, patients and if they're out in the field if, if workers are out in the fields. We're, we're not recommending global screening, certainly not in California. There's no local transmission in California. Uh, I don't see that happening right now. So the, the migrant workers come regularly from Mexico? Oh, we're still not screening them routinely unless there is evidence of symptomatic infection. have a question. Just to confirm, a woman with a past infection years ago likely will not have a problem with a current pregnancy? Correct. Now, we don't have IgG antibodies available. So, um, they're not commercially available and they're not something we can order even through our, our public health labs. So, someone would have had to have had, we wouldn't have information from years ago, but assuming they might have been infected years ago, then in theory, they would be okay for the current pregnancy. But you'd have to really have ev IgM evidence of someone in a recent exposure period and say, now you're okay for a future pregnancy. 
Um, question, if LA County is not testing local people without travel history, how will they know when local transmission starts? I think that it will probably start, you know, when we start seeing people suggesting the symptoms. That's how the cases in Florida came to attention. So there were some symptomatic individuals. They didn't appear to have the typical travel um, or sexual transmission history. And then surveillance starts. So we will likely not know about local transmission until we start seeing any symptomatic individuals. But I also think that we don't need to panic and just start worrying about testing everybody in the state. That's not the way to do it. Yeah, I would agree with what he's saying. I think when we start to see uh, clusters of cases of symptomatic individuals without travel history. That's, of course, when we start worrying about local transmission. And I just wanted to bring up that all of the vector control agencies are probably um, doing their best at surveillance. And I'm not sure if you know, Dr. Silverman, if in LA County they're already doing testing in vectors. Are they, are they do, starting that? Well, I mean, the, the vector surveillance people are really very active. Obviously, they're very involved in West Nile because there are cases of West Nile now, but um, I would assume that the same vector control people in the counties are testing um, as they look for mosquitoes in these areas. They're probably testing for evidence of virus in, in some samples of those mosquitoes as well. You want to know whether it's being carried in any of the local mosquitoes. And that you can do that. We have not heard anything about that. In contrast to the way we know that there are uh, mosquitoes carrying West Nile in the area. I know we're running a little bit over on the time. If there's any last questions, please let us know. I will, I will repeat again that the slides and the recording will be on the CMQCC website. It's www.cmqcc.org. It will also be on the California Department of Public Health website, and we will have them up on Monday. It looks like there's one final question there to clarify. If a woman was infected pre-pregnancy is then immune, is there still a risk of a future baby being infected? No. Um, yeah, I would, I, the baby only if the mother is infected in pregnancy. Yes. Yeah, I would echo that. Okay, great. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much um, to our panelists for a great conversation. We will be sure to have everything posted as soon as possible. There are no CEUs for this webinar um, to the question just asked. And please let us know if you have any, any additional questions or feedback. Thanks for everybody's attention. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.